Okay, well, good morning and welcome everyone. You can clearly see I'm, I'm not using a microphone right now, but we have that option. But we generally have good acoustics in the room. So how is this going? Can everybody hear me? Wonderful, great. We're off to a great start, everyone. So my name is Noreeni Lejon. I'm director of the Information Law and Policy Centre, one of the academic centres here based at the University of London. And I'm delighted to welcome you all. And it's fantastic you're able to join us here today for the Centre's eighth annual lecture and annual conference. And today we'll be focusing on the theme of human and machine, digital rights and AI. We have a really excellent programme taking place today and tomorrow. We have distinguished regulators, practitioners, representatives from industry and civil society, and leading academic experts who will address some very key questions on the legal and broader societal impacts of AI-based systems, many of which involve machine learning and increasingly generative AI that are rapidly shaping how society functions and how we live our lives. And then, of course, the big question of what role human rights law should play in this brave new world. We're very excited about the fact today that this is going to be a very rich conversation that is multi-stakeholder and cross-sector with perspectives and insights from eminent speakers and attendees from all over the UK, Europe, the US and Australia. Hopefully tomorrow no one will turn up as a cat avatar, but you never know. So over the next two days, we'll be exploring some of the following very important questions. What role should the law play in governing vast energy intensive cloud computing systems and large language models needed to power generative AI tools that also have major consequences for the environment? Does indiscriminate monitoring or scanning of all messages across an online service constitute a lawful and proportionate interference with the rights to freedom of expression, privacy and non-discrimination in a democratic society? How should the law tackle increasingly sophisticated forms of online disinformation and AI-generated deep fakes given the huge risk they pose to the human right to receive and share information and ideas in the 21st century? Should clear limits be placed on the indiscriminate use of powerful AI tools in certain sectors or for certain purposes? So for instance, we know that powerful AI biometric technologies like facial recognition could play a major role in improving public safety and medical diagnoses and treatment. But these machine learning systems can also produce inaccurate results and unfair bias. These problems are almost inevitable if AI-based systems are not subject to robust design, testing and review, and when they are deployed indiscriminately and repurposed for very different tasks from which they were originally created for. And finally, do risk-based approaches to AI regulation and governance ensure the adequate protection and oversight of human rights? And on that note, it is a privilege and a very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Robert Spano. Robert is partner in the London office of Gibson Dunn. He is a visiting professor of law at the University of Oxford and a tenured professor of law at the University of Iceland. Robert is an honorary venture of the Middle Temple and has published extensively in the areas of international dispute resolution, public international law, digital rights and human rights law. During his time at the European Court of Human Rights and as former president of the Strasbourg Court, he took part in deciding some of the court's leading landmark judgments, examining digital rights, mass <coughs> surveillance, national security, online content moderation, and freedom of expression. These have included the Grand Chamber judgments of Delphi versus Estonia in 2015 and Big Brother Watch versus the United Kingdom in 2021. Robert, you're very welcome. In terms of format for this morning, Robert will speak for about 30 minutes, and we will then go straight into our keynote panel, which will begin at about 11.45. We'll then have some time for Q&A with all of the speakers, including Robert then. So I would like to thank you all for coming here today, all of our speakers, all of our discussants, all of our chairs, all those attending. I will now invite Robert Spano to deliver the ILPC's annual lecture for 2023, entitled Surveillance Activities, Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Rights, Red Lines or a Balancing of Interest. Thank you very much indeed, Nora. I'm very happy to be here today. 
I was reflecting this morning when I was making my final preparations for this talk um, that I, this I think is probably the 10th talk I've given on a similar matter this year and each time I prepare things have rapidly changed. That is one of the challenges but also what makes this field extremely interesting. It is cutting edge it is rapidly developing and one needs to be on one's toes to be able to follow everything. There is also quite a bit of intellectual work that needs to be done in all of our various fields. I come at this from the intersection of tech and fundamental rights. That has been my specialization for the last 10 years or so. That is what I mainly do now in my private practice. Uh, advise on the intersection between AI and fundamental rights systems. I'm going to proceed in four parts in this annual lecture. First, I want to give some preliminary remarks about the evolution of what can be termed European digital constitutionalism. I want to ask how fundamental rights principles are evolving overall in this policy debate and want to say a few words in this regard about the non-binding but important recent constellation of values within the European Union's Declaration of Rights, Digital Rights and Principles. I will then focus on, in particular, biometric identification as a particular type of technology, which when used live and remotely based on the use of AI system poses particular problems for fundamental rights. And I will want to start by talking about the position under the European Convention on Human Rights as most recently laid down in the judgment of Glukin versus Russia of 4 July this year. Thirdly, I will revert to the legislative debate on biometric identification within the context of the EU's proposal for an Artificial Intelligence Act, which I'm sure everyone in this room knows very well is now at the trilogue stage and where the issue indeed of remote live biometric identification has become one of the most contentious issues between the co-legislatures. And fourth and finally, I will conclude with five questions and reflections uh, which may hopefully inspire some debate uh, during the keynote panel. So my first part, the, I want to say, why do I want to talk a bit about the European Union's Declaration of Digital Rights and Principle, which was signed by uh, the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, on 15 December last? It is because it is a very progressive set of values, policy orientations, which are important for the debate we're having here today. The principles are shaped around six themes. I'm not going to go, I don't have time to review them all. But three of them are as follows, putting people and their rights at the center of the digital transformation. The third principle is ensuring the freedom of choice online. And the fifth principle is increasing safety, security, and empowerment of individuals. Others deal with sustainability, supporting solidarity and inclusion, and so forth. Now, if we take the first, putting people and their rights at the center of the digital transformation, the declaration is built around the principle that technology should serve and benefit all people living in the European Union and empower them to pursue their aspirations. It should not infringe upon their security and fun or fundamental rights. Signatories of the Declaration will commit to making sure that the digital transformation benefits everyone and improves the lives of all people living in the EU. They will take measures to ensure our rights are respected online as well as offline. The EU will promote this approach both at home and on the international stage. When it comes to ensuring freedom of choice online, which is the part of the Declaration which focuses mainly on algorithmic and AI systems. Everyone should be empowered to make their own informed choices online. This includes when interacting with artificial intelligence and algorithms. The declaration, and this is, I think, crucial for our discussion here today, the declaration seeks to guarantee this by promoting, and I quote, human-centric, trustworthy, and ethical artificial intelligence systems 
which are used in line with EU values, and it pu pushes for transparency around the use of algorithms and artificial intelligence. And finally, the principle of increasing safety, security, and empowerment of individuals, the declaration calls for everyone to have effective control over their personal and non-personal data in line with EU law. It pays specific attention to children and young people who should feel safe and empowered online. Now, why do I start off with these, one can say, progressive value-based pronouncements that are formulating the ecosphere of European digital constitutionalism? Because it is within that context which I think one has to inform oneself when one is thinking about what I understand this conference to be really reflecting on, it is policy positions into how policy positions on how AI systems in particular interact and should interact with fundamental rights. It puts into sharp relief the debate around um, the, the question whether fundamental rights in the classical online environment are fit for purpose on uh, offline, are fit for pur purpose online. The normative equivalency paradigm, which is very much the focus point of debate between international institutions, and is something that I hope this conference will be in a position to contribute to. So let me then, with this first part, move to my second part and focus as a particular use case, one can say, on live biometric identification, in particular using facial technology systems. On 4 July, and I want to start off with a convention position, the European Court of Human Rights handed down its judgment in the case of Lukin versus Russia which concerned an application, and yes, the court is still deciding Russian cases, it concerned an application by a Russian national, Mr. Glukin, against the Russian Federation alleging violations of the convention related to Russia's use of facial recognition to technology. Now this case concerned, uh, factually, Mr. Glukin's administrative <coughs> conviction for his failure to notify the authorities of his intention to hold a solo demonstration. He traveled on the Moscow underground with a life-size cardboard of a Mr. Konstantin Kotov, a pro professor, protester whose case had attracted widespread <laughs> attention in the media holding a banner that said, I'm facing up to five years, I've taken out the expletives, <coughs> I'm facing up to five years for peaceful protests. And it was a reference to uh, Article 212 of the Russian Criminal Code, which uh, Mr. Kotov was, uh, was sentenced on the basis of. Mr. Glukin submitted that he had been filmed by CCTV cameras installed in the Moscow underground, identified by facial recognition technology, and subsequently convicted of an administrative offense on the basis of the evidence obtained. Notably, and this is important for what I'll say later, notably, under Russian law, there had been no judicial decision authorizing the collection, storage, and use of video footage of him. The court concluded that the processing of personal data, nothing new here, this flows from the S. and Marper jurisprudence, that the applicant's personal data and the processing of the data in the framework of the administrative offense proceedings against him, including the use of facial recognition technology. I'm not going to go. There is a very interesting evidentiary-based issue in the judgment. The Russian government did not concede that facial recognition technology had been used, but did not deny that it had been used, admitted that screenshots had been taken of him and inputted into the system for later use in a live remote setting. And so the court inferred from the fact that the government did not deny the use of facial recognition technology that actually it had been used for the purposes of the case. And this, I think, is the correct evidentiary-based, inference-based approach in the Strasbourg Court, which is applied to this novel sphere. Now, this 
use of facial recognition technology, not surprising, amounted to an interference with his right to respect for his private life. I want to note that interestingly, although not surprisingly, the court referred to the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights 2020 report entitled Impact of New Technologies on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights in the Context of Assemblies Including Peaceful Protests. The High Commissioner says in this report, and I think it is important for the debate that is now ongoing in the trilogue procedure in the European Union, the High Commissioner says audiovisual recording and facial recognition techniques should only be used when such measures meet the three-part test of legality, necessity, and proportionality. The possibility that recourse to facial recognition technology during peaceful protest could ever meet the test of necessity and proportionality, given its intrusiveness and serious chilling effects, has been questioned. Authorities should generally refrain from recording assembly participants as required by the need to show proportionality. Exceptions should only be considered when there are concrete indications that serious criminal offenses are actually taking place or that there is a cause to su suspect imminent and serious criminal behavior. You can see the UN commissioner in a 2020 report does not take an absolutist position when it comes to the use of facial recognition technology, but uses the tripartite human rights, fundamental rights test of legality, leg legitimate aim, and proportionality. Moving to how the court dealt with the issue on the basis of the above, it applied its classical necessary in a democratic society requirement under Article 8.2, and the court first assessed the level of the actual interference with the right to respect for private life, finding the police's measure to be, quote, particularly intrusive, especially insofar as live facial rec recognition technology was concerned. There is a reference here in the judgment to the language of S. and Marper, uh, which is as follows. The protection afforded by, remember, S. and Marper is a completely different case, of course. But using the same language, in this case, the court says, the protection afforded by Article 8 of the Convention would be unacceptably weakened if the use of modern scientific techniques in the criminal justice system were allowed at any cost and without carefully balancing the potential benefits of the extensive use, the potential benefits of the extensive use of such techniques against important private life interests. A high level of justification was therefore required for them to be considered necessary in a democratic society, and in fact the court uses the highest level of justification is required for the use of live facial recognition technology. The court then proceeds, and I think for those that are not fully familiar with convention case law, there has been one particular methodolo methodological approach, especially in recent years, which has been very prevalent in the surveillance type tech cases. And that is the merging of legality, legitimate aim, and proportionality into one methodological framework of assessment. In the court, I used to call this legislative proportionality. And we, we used to make the distinction between distinct case-by-case -case proportionality, which is the regular approach, and legislative proportionality, which is what, when the court basically assesses proportionality not by divorcing lawfulness and legitimate aim. When it came to legality, the court expressed strong doubts that the domestic legal provisions met the quality of law requirement. Biometric personal data under Russian law was permitted in connection with the administration of justice, which basically says nothing. It's, it's an open-ended check for the use of the most intrusive measures. This is important when we're looking at the various proposals under the EU AI Act, which I will come to in a moment. The court then took other factors into account, and, but when it came to the legitimate aim, and this is the crucial part, the court said, 
And I'm not sure I would necessarily have worded it this, in this way, but the court says, and I quote, the question is not whether the processing of biometric personal data by facial recognition technology may in general be regarded as justified under the convention. The only issue to be considered by the court is whether the processing of the applicant's personal data was justified under Article 8.2 of the Convention. So in other words, the court says it will not take an absolutist position. But to say that the question doesn't arise is, I think, a bit imprecise. Because in Big Brother Watch and others versus the United Kingdom, which I sat in and presided, we actually we, we were faced with that question whether Article 8 by definition would prohibit the use of bulk surveillance mechanisms. So, and we answered that question in the negative. Now, we can debate on whether that was the correct approach. I think it was, but it was an approach where that question was considered to be a preliminary threshold question. In other words, never can such a system fulfill the proportionality requirements of Article 8 2. And one has to proceed on the basis that that is, you know, theoretically possible. Like you have a, and I think, for example, the use of emotionally manipulative AI systems, which the AI Act will prohibit, and I think there is no debate within the trial logs on that issue. Question: Would the European Court of Human Rights, faced with such systems, consider that it still would have to go through the classical proportionality assessment? I'm not sure. <coughs> Moving then, so just to, to sum up the, the, the convention position in Glukin, a violation was found. This was not proportionate due to lack of legality requirement, uh, due to the fact that the, the specificities of the use were too widespread and so forth. And also that it, this was used in, the, uh, in, in, a, in a case where uh, the alleged perpetrator was exercising his convention rights under Article 10 and 11. This was a peaceful assembly. This was the merging of Article 10 and 11, as you know, when there is expressive activity in a public forum. Glukin is, I think, broadly consistent with the court's approach in the surveillance cases, both the targeted cases, Roman Zakharov versus Russia, the bulk surveillance cases, Big Brother Watch and others, when it comes to the methodological approach. I would also mention the recent guidelines on facial recognition from 2021 under Convention 108 plus in, in the Council of Europe, which is also one which is based on a non-absolutist approach that for law enforcement purposes, biometric data processing using facial recognition technologies should in principle be permitted with, with very strong guardrails. So let me then move to my third part. Uh, which is the proposal for an EU AI Act. And the reason this is an interesting debate is the contrast between the approach of the commissions in its initial proposal, then the slightly nuanced approach by the council in its general approach, and then the quite radical, and I'm not using radical in a pejorative sense, I'm just, I'm saying with, without any qualified value-based, I'm just saying it, it was a radical shift from the initial proposals of the Commission and the Council on the Article 5 prohibited AI systems. The European Parliament preceding all three legislators are using a risk profile, a, a categorization of risk, but the Parliament expanded the concept of prohibited AI systems under Article 5 to include the absolutist position that live biometric identification should be prohibited even in the law enforcement context. And that, of course, deviates quite radically from the position taken by the Commission and the Council where those kinds of systems are considered high, uh, are or permitted in the law enforcement context based on certain requirements. But let me just go through this a bit because the interesting part to this is what is going on here? And what does this tell us about the way in which the fundamental rights debate paradigm 
is shifting when it comes to us understanding better and better the potential use cases when it comes to AI systems and the potential consequences for human life that flow from the use of such technology. The Commission's proposal, initial proposal, classifies remote biometric systems, both live and post, as high risk. It bans the use of live biometric identification in public places for law enforcement purposes unless certain conditions apply. Such systems can be used when strictly necessary, which uses the, the CJU case law approach in principle under Article 7 of the Charter, the, European, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, when strictly necessary to search for crime victims, prevent threats to life and physical safety or terrorist attacks, detect, identify, and locate suspects of serious offenses, those legitimizing the issuing of a European arrest warrant. Proportionality requirements are foreseen, especially in relation to the nature of the situation where to deploy the technology, the consequences of deploying it, the temporal, geographical, and personal limitations of the deployment. And then, importantly, only judicial or administrative independent authorities can authorize the use of such systems based on reasoned requests. Member states can adopt national rules on the request, issuance, exercise, and supervision of the authorizations. So, you can see that that framework, when viewed at least prima facie, seems to me broadly in line with the conceptual framework and the three-part test. Now, I'm not saying it would be in conformity with it in a particular case. I'm saying if you look at it broadly, it seems to be a framework which fits into the existing tripartite test required under Article 8 of legality, legitimate aim, and proportionality using a legislative proportionality test. The Council then, uh, at the end of last year, made some subtle changes to the Commission's approach, albeit maintaining its essential characteristic. It clarified that ex post biometric identification remains subject to data protection requirements. It also extended the derogations of the ban on live biometric identification in, in public places. Of course, subject to uh, the exceptions that I mentioned. Interestingly, the Council's approach it was promulgated, if I recall correctly, towards the end of last year, November, December. And then the European Parliament's position was was published last summer, around June, July. Now, what happened in the space of those six months is, of course, chat GPT. In particular, the advent of the large language model, the way in which that affected the political discourse. In other words, AI became something that the regular person identifies with readily, and it became a source of massive political awareness. It is within that context that the politicians in the European Parliament, which is a natural occurrence, seized the issue and transformed the EU AI Act's balance between business innovation on the one hand versus human rights, trustworthy AI ethics based fundamental rights framework, where one can say that the balance in the initial commission's proposal as an internal market mechanism was in favor to some extent to the innovation type business oriented view of the proposal towards a rather dramatic shift towards an AI human right 
trustworthy, human-centric position. And I think that's important to realize that now the co-legislators in the trilogues, they are grappling with where this will end up because there are strong interests on all sides that are implicated. For example, as I mentioned, law enforcement authorities all over Europe through their representatives in the legislative process are making absolutely clear that it is not acceptable for them to stop using live facial recognition technology to identify uh, and s assist uh, in preventing terrorist attacks, uh, 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 preventing many of the strong public interest grounds that they are concerned with. Now, whether one disagrees with that or not, that is the, the situation. So we'll see how that ends up. So in other words, under the EU Parliament's draft, the police's use of real-time remote biometric identification systems in public spaces, for example, in a metro, would be prohibited without exception, even for law enforcement. And as I mentioned, this contrasts significantly with uh, the approach taken by the ECHR in Glukin, at least on its face, whereby Russian domestic law permitted the processing of biometric personal data in connection with the uh, investigation and prosecution of any offense, irrespective of its nature and gravity. In other words, a proportionality assessment is the ECHR position, a proportionality assessment is the Commission's position, a proportionality assessment is the Council positions, a proportionality assessment is the UN Human Rights Commissioner's position, a proportionality assessment is the Council of Europe's overall policy position under Convention uh, 108 plus, the EU Parliament's position, which I think is to some extent one can say ties into, and that's why I started at the outset with the non-binding European Union Declaration of Digital Rights and Principles, fits into a very progressive view of the evolution of European digital constitutionalism, where we have to start drawing red lines when it comes to the use of AI systems. And it is interesting in that context because the tradition the tradition in European human rights law, as I will end with at the moment, is, in a moment, the tradition under European human rights law is we do not usually take absolutist positions on the protection of fundamental rights with the exception of the Article 3 torture and ill treatment type activity, slavery and servitude under Article 4 of the Convention, but most of the other rights under Articles 8, 9, 10, and 11 are qualified, which means that they will be subjected to a necessity assessment on the facts. So what AI is doing, it is pushing us into a situation where we're faced with potentially very dramatic consequences for human life of the use of artificial intelligence systems driving the legislator into identifying use cases which should be subjected to red lines. And that, of course, for us in the legal community, in the policy-based community, is a very interesting position. So let me conclude with five uh, questions and reflections uh, of a different, so they're different, they're both legal, but they're also policy-based. The first one is, is normative, methodological, because we're seeing on the one hand I, I've mentioned the convention position vis-a-vis -vis the EU's potential position, although as I will predict here, and I'll allow myself to predict, the next trilogue meeting is on 6 December. There are a lot of, there's a lot of news going around of what is happening, what are the debates that are ongoing. No one knows absolutely for sure what actually will be the outcome, but this issue that I've been <laughs> discussing is one of the crucial ones. So, the first question is a threshold issue. Does EU law allow for a divergence of fundamental rights protections with the ECHR? Most of you that do this type of work will know the answer to that question is in principle, yes. 
Article 6.3 of the Treaty of the European Union, the TEU, establishes that fundamental rights guaranteed by the ECHR constitute general principles of EU law, thus having the status of primary law. Likewise, that applies likewise to the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and Article 52.3 of the Charter provides that Charter rights corresponding to those of the ECHR must be interpreted as having the same meaning and scope as the rights enshrined in the Convention. And according to ECJU case law, cases like M M MCB and Falker and Sheke, uh, Article 7 of the Charter uh, provides protection of personal data, which in principle has the same meaning as and scope under Article as under Article 8 of the Convention as interpreted by the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Nonetheless, uh, the Charter does provide explicitly in the final sentence of 52.3 that the EU is not inhibited from granting a higher level of protection of fundamental rights and according to the explanatory report, limitations upon fundamental rights established in the ECHR should not affect the autonomy of union law and that of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Those that follow the debate on this will, of course, know that this was the core issue excluding accession of the EU to the European Convention on Human Rights under Opinion 213 of 18 December 2014. This means that although Glukin may provide significant guidance to <coughs> EU actors, both the legislator and the CJU would in principle retain their autonomy to lay down higher standards of protection, for example, by providing a ban, if that is the outcome. So there is nothing at the, at the outset which excludes a higher protection based on the protection of personal data, the right to private life, the right to personal autonomy, human dignity, all components of Article 8, as a basis for a legislative intervention on the EU, which would pro prescribe certain usages of AI systems. I would, however, say from a pure policy position, this would create a divergence in the law of the app, app applicable to the 27 EU member states on the one hand, and the other 19 member states of the Council of Europe that are not members of the EU and are mainly subjected to the minimum standards under the Convention, and that's that. So these states, the 19 outside the EU, would normatively be in a position to use real-time biometric identification when it fulfills the glucan necessary in a democratic test. While EU members, due to the EU AI Act having the basis of a regulation, which would have direct effect and primacy in EU law would be outright prohibited from doing so if the Parliament's position is retained. Second question, would the Commission's and Council's proposal create a normative framework that would in principle, and I say that very cautiously because I don't know any more than you do what will be the end result, but if, you, if I look at it on their face, the proposals as drafted, would that this framework in principle be glucan compliant? And I think my answer would be threefold. First, the Commission's original proposal only prohibited real-time biometric identification for the purposes of law enforcement unless strictly necessary to meet certain objectives. Prevention of a substantial and imminent threat, which I think is in principle Convention compliant. The scope of the permissible use cases exclude minor offenses which I think would also be required under the Convention. And I think that flows partly from Glucin. It, there would be, under the Commission's proposal, proportionality assessment based on certain defined criteria, which also lives well with the Glucin approach. And live biometric identification would be subject to judicial or independent administrative authority authorization. This is an interesting issue under Article 8 because, as you know, the court has been very reticent about requiring actual judicial authorizations, even in the bulk surveillance context. It is a bit different there, but at least when it comes to certain stages in that process, 
there has been some flexibility of allowing for systems which open up administrative authorizations, even in the bulk interception phase when it comes to a particular part, which is the most privacy intrusive, the search for receptors, that in that we had a massive discussion in the court, and it's clear the approach of asking for requiring judicial intervention at that stage was not retained. Third, how would the European Parliament's absolutist position, I call it that for the sake of clarity, conform with the member states' positive Osman obligation? This derives from the Osman versus UK positive obligation under Article 2 to take all available and reasonable measures to prevent threats to life or serious bodily harm. There may be situations where actually the convention requires action by the member states based on actionable intelligence to prevent harm to life. Now, having an absolutist prohibition on the use of live facial recognition technology, which can clearly be, and that's scientifically proven, although there are problems with any system, uh, including personal data and the lack of uh, clear safeguards against bias, as, as Nora mentioned at the outset, which is something we need to discuss, how would that fit well in, in a system which does not allow law enforcement at all to use these kinds of mechanisms? Fourth, is the European Parliament's position as to the relative weight of the right to private life, as well as the right to the protection of personal data and personal autonomy, which I think if you look at the recitals to the EU AI Act as reformulated by the Parliament, underpin the proposal to ban outright the use of live re remote biometric identification in conformity with the prevailing views in the evolving field of digital constitutionalism. To what extent would uh, EU legislator in the Parliament be able to rely on the rights, the, the, the declaration of digital rights and principles to base the normative approach taken? My answer is, I'm not necessarily sure that the declaration goes as far as excluding uh, live biometric identification within that context because the declaration clearly talks about that we should not negate the uses of AI systems to protect the public interest, potentially safety, uh, prevent harm, and so forth. So finally, I just want to, fifthly, which is, which is sort of a forecasting issue. In practice, as I mentioned, there seems to be strong pushback against the Parliament's proposal in the trilogue, given that the proposal would significantly weaken the state's ability to fight serious crimes, such as terrorism, by removing their ability to rely on real-time biometric identification. My prediction is, for what it's worth, um, that it's unlikely, it's, I would say unlikely, that the European Parliament's position will prevail, <coughs> although not excluded within a broader political compromise, as there are a lot of discussions for those that are following the, fa the issue of foundation models and the regulation of foundation models, uh, moving potentially away from binding norms to voluntary self-regulation at the outset. Uh, I see grimaces in the room, but, but that is potentially what may happen. So to conclude, as I mentioned, European human rights law seldom takes absolutist positions, with the exception of the most egregious human rights violations like torture and ill-treatment. Our fundamental rights traditions have historically revolved around the concept of necessity and proportionality, a recognition that no man is an island and that preserving our rights sometimes requires giving way to some, giving way some of our rights for the collective good. This has been, up until now, at least in the offline environment, and in the, our first steps taken in the online environment, this has been the prevailing position. However, these are my, this is my, these are my final words because I'm out of time, the advent of AI may certainly challenge some of the historically accepted norms and principles of the European tradition. It is not excluded that some use cases do justify red lines, as can be seen from the proposal for an EU AI Act, 
There is, for example, not much discussion on banning outright emotionally manipulative AI use cases and others mentioned social scoring, for example, which seems to will be retained in the, in the final draft. So we are indeed moving in this new field of European digital constitutionalism into a recalibration of the European tradition due to the advent of artificial intelligence towards us finally drawing some red lines when it comes to the way in which our human lives will be impacted for the future. Thank you very much. A really superb lecture and I'm sure and like many of you um, I also have so many questions that I'm sure we could all put to Robert Spano now but there is so much more to follow so please bear with us for just a couple of moments while the other fantastic members of our keynote panel come down and join us no pressure <laughs> Okay, so everybody, hello again, and I'm delighted to be moderating and chairing our keynote panel. Our first speaker will be Dr. Natalie Byron. She is a leading researcher and policy advisor with expertise in justice system reform, evidence generation, data-driven technologies, and justice data governance. Between 2018 and 2020, Dr. Byron was seconded to the UK Ministry of Justice as expert <coughs> advisor on open data as part of an ongoing project of digital court reform. Her influential report led to the creation of new mechanisms for monitoring the impact of digitalization on access to justice and reforms to justice data governance. Dr. Byron has given expert evidence to several parliamentary committees and her writing on issues of justice reform and data governance have been published in leading legal and national press including the Financial Times. She holds a number of public appointments, including membership of the Ministry of Justice's Senior Data Governance Panel and the Civil Justice Council. She is also an honorary senior research fellow at UCL's Faculty of Laws and a fellow at Connected by Data. Dr. Byron will discuss the use of AI-based systems and predictive tools in legal services and the regulatory gaps and challenges therein. Natalie, you have the floor if you'd like to sit or stand, whatever is more comfortable for you. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure and privilege <coughs> um, to be here today alongside such a stellar panel. Now, in the 10 minutes that I have with you today, I'm going to explore an issue that's little discussed at present, but has profound significance for the right of access to justice in the digital age the growing use of digital tools as part of the delivery of legal services and the adequacy of the regulatory response to these. And to illustrate the issues and tensions, I'm going to focus on research I have led into the regulation of a particular kind of technology, case outcome predictive tools in civil litigation. Use the microphone, please. Is that better? Yeah. Excellent, fantastic. 
Um, so firstly, what are case outcome predictive tools? Well, broadly speaking, they are statistical or machine learning methods that are used to forecast the outcome of a civil litigation event or case. Um, they detect patterns in past civil litigation data and use these to predict outcomes. And the sources of data that they use are both legal documents, but also other data, including biographical data on judges and legal professionals. Now, although these tools are relatively new, they are increasingly big business. As you can see, examples of existing companies developing or deploying these tools include Case Text, Lex Machina, Solomonic, and Sprout AI. Now, earlier this year, Thomson Reuters acquired Case Text for an unprecedented $650 million. This is the biggest acquisition in Thomson Reuters history, despite the fact that Case Text is a relatively small, relatively new company without a proven track record in this space. So, why are they such big business? Well, the use cases for these tools in the context of legal services include informal litigation strategy, supporting the investment strategies of litigation funders, and assisting bulk users of the civil justice system, so think large law firms and insurance companies, uh, to identify which claims to settle. In terms of increasing access to justice, proponents argue that there's potential for these tools to reduce the cost of legal advice by scaling access to the type of legal expertise that lawyers have traditionally provided. Some even argue that in time, these tools could augment or replace the need for legal advice and representation by lawyers entirely. And this has certainly caught the attention of some sections of the media who have heralded the potential of these tools to bring about the end of lawyers, which we're all very excited about. Um, now, in the context of a global crisis in access to justice and unwillingness on the part of governments to spend limited public resources on access to lawyers, it's clear to see the intuitive appeal of these tools. However, if I can leave you with one message today, it's this. The, <coughs> the benefits of an expanded role for these tools in terms of access to justice are speculative at best, while the risks are both material and urgent. And what's more, the risks these tools pose are not attracting sufficient attention, regulators are not equipped or resourced to address them, and the root cause of these risks, why they exist in the first place, is poorly understood by both government and regulators alike. Now, many of the sources of risk are common to other types of AI and data-driven technology. There's currently insufficient transparency about who is developing these tools or when they're being used. There's no register of providers or users of these tools, and an almost a complete absence of agreed performance standards to help consumers compare their accuracy or their sensitivity. In short, it's very difficult to tell whether these tools actually work on their own terms. Now, we might consider this to be less of a problem when the primary market for these tools is people with legal expertise who can use their own existing expertise to evaluate the predictions these tools produce. But when these are targeted at lay consumers, as in increasingly the intention, there's clear potential for people to be misled into taking decisions that have an adverse impact on their legal rights. Now, if you'll bear with me for two minutes, I wanted to expand on two of the risks, bias and the potential for these tools to exacerbate existing inequalities of arms across the justice system. So on bias, case outcome predictive tools are based on historic data about patterns in decision making. They predict outcomes based on decisions that have been made in the past. Now, this feature of these tools will result in consumers who've historically received worse outcomes on account of discrimination, bias, or underrepresentation within the legal system, continuing to have these decisions recommended to them into the future. As one interviewee who I spoke to as part of my research stated, in the case of a small claims court where there's an imbalance of power, you are perpetrating historic injustice onto future generations. You are reproducing the bias and behavior patterns of the past, which is extremely serious. Now, I think it's really important to note here that this interview, of this, the interviewee wasn't someone from civil society, he wasn't an academic, this is someone who actually runs one of these companies, who's tried to expand into direct to consumer market and actually stepped away from it because he decided that the risks were far too great for him to bear. Now, given where this concern comes from, I think we ought to take it extremely seriously. Secondly, the potential for these tools to exacerbate inequalities of arms. And the way in which they have the potential to exacerbate inequalities of arms is, is through two things. But is by concentrating the benefit of these tools in the hands of repeat players and litigants who are already well-resourced. 
And the reason for this is due to factors, is due to two factors, unequal access to data and unequal access to funding. So firstly, um, the accuracy of case outcome predictive tools depends on their ability to be trained on comprehensive data. However, in England and Wales, across the civil justice system, government has failed to invest in the collection and publication of high quality data. And these issues are particularly acute in the so-called high volume, low value areas of law. So think employment, personal injury, welfare benefits, housing, small claims, and all the areas where there's real interest in deploying these tools. Um, the civil justice system as a whole has been described by the Civil Justice Council, no less, as being a data desert, particularly in relation to vulnerable litigants. Judgments in the county courts and employment tribunals are not routinely published. And as serious in the context of the use of these tools is the lack of data on settlement, the number of characteristics and claims that settle before they reach trial. In 2000, between 2000 and 2018, only, on average, only 3% of cases in our civil justice system actually went to a trial. So the absence of data on what happens in those cases is extremely serious. Now, just because this data is not publicly available doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means that where it does exist, it's held by repeat players, so insurance companies and large law firms, or the legal publishers, who have invested huge amounts of money in acquiring this data. Now, the fact that only well-resourced private actors have access to this data gives them an inherent advantage, and it means that these tools are likely to develop in, these interests, in their interests rather than those of access to justice. Inequalities of arms are also created by the lack of access to funding and business models. Now, if you look at this graph, in England and Wales, the amount of investment going into legal tech firms that serve big law, so business to business, dwarfs the amount of funding for firms directly serving consumers. And in this regard, we're increasingly out of step with other jurisdictions. For example, in the US, as this research from Alma and Seiko shows, investment is much more evenly split between these two areas, which is partly a function of better availability of public data about the system. So, how well equipped is existing regulation to deal with these issues? Well, at present, the answer is not very well at all. The regulatory framework created by the Legal Services Act is arguably well placed to address the potential risks created by the widespread adoption of these tools. In particular, the regulatory objectives contained in the Act to promote access to justice, uphold the rule of law, and protect consumers seem particularly useful when we consider the potential harms identified, which extend to collective and societal as well as individual harms. However, at present, this regime does not apply. Uh, unless services are provided by entities that already provide a reserved legal activity. Most of the firms developing these tools are as part of the unregulated legal sector, which means they're not captured. In addition, these tools are rarely caught by GDPR Article 22 restrictions on automated decision-making and profiling. And this is because they're routinely marketed as decision scaffolding, providing information only. Now, this distinction may hold when the tools are aimed at legal professionals, but again, when the market shifts to being unrepresented litigants who don't have the knowledge or access to advice to challenge recommendations, what is marketed as advisory may in fact become determinative or decisive. In addition, to enforce rights, consumers must bring claims through the court to secure compensation, injunctive or declaratory relief. The bar for redress is simply too high. So, what are the solutions? In the short term, those engaging with parliamentarians around the Digital Protection and Digital the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill should encourage them to resist the weakening of provisions on automated decision making and include tools that predict case outcomes, in the, uh, even if predictions are not determinative in the category of significant decisions. Secondly, academia and civil society should keep a close eye on the government response to their consultation on the AI white paper. There's an urgent need to strengthen the role of legal regulators and look again at the reserved activities to see how we might get a better handle on what's happening in the unregulated legal sector. Finally, and critically, we need policymakers to focus on the ecosystem and not just the tools. Equitable development requires parity of access to data and funding. Now, this week, the Lord Chancellor and the Senior Judiciary launched their vision for a digital justice system, harnessing AI to help people make informed choices about their dispute resolution options and resolve their cases more quickly. 
if they're serious about the potential of these tools for those who are currently poorly served by the justice system, they need to be compelled to take urgent action to support their effective and equitable development. And achieving that vision requires all of us to speak out and speak now. Thank you very much. Well, we're getting slides up. Huge thanks to Natalie for a very relevant and I think a bit of a shift in terms of the application of these automated decision-making systems and AI-based systems. I particularly like the point you raised regarding how significant it is that regulation and governance should be focusing on the ecosystem and the context in which these tools and systems are being deployed, which often does seem to be and omission, no matter what sector you're dealing with, and in this case, the ramifications are very significant because, as you mentioned, it's consequences for some of the most vulnerable people in society who are subject to the Leviathan of the legal system. So thanks so much for that. And of course, everyone will explore this more in our Q&A section of the panel. But right now, I'm delighted to introduce you to our second speaker, Steve Wood. Steve is an independent consultant, researcher, and writer, and founded his company, Privacy X Consulting, in 2022 long before the Twitter X transition. Should so have that, yes. Just, you know, it's very important. I think you should have a conversation with Elon Musk about this too. He is also a special advisor to the Magic Circle law firm, Allen and Overy. He has extensive expertise in data protection policy, practice, and strategy, with 15 years experience at the UK regulator, the Information Commissioner's Office, six years of which he held the post of Deputy Commissioner and Chief Policy Advisor. This period included a key role in the negotiation, preparation, and implementation of the GDPR, during which time Steve was also involved in leading the ICO's policy responses to groundbreaking issues such as Cambridge Analytica and the wider investigation into political uses of data, including the report Democracy Disrupted. Steve will be discussing the intersection between generative AI and the UK-EU GDPR and the related tensions and lessons there within the context of enforcement. Okay, um, thank you very much, and I'm um, delighted to, to be here speaking to you all today. So yeah, that's my topic. I'm going to talk about um, generative AI, large language models, the tensions with data protection law, and what some of the actions um, are in relation to how the data protection regulators have responded to that, particularly over the, um, over the last year. So I think just to, to set the context, I think we've already had reference to it a number of times in the presentations today, but generative AI, large language mo models, have already become mainstream in the last year. The private sector is obviously ahead of the public sector in that deployment, which is not unexpected in terms of the resources that the private sector has. But we can obviously expect um, public sector uses to come online um, fairly soon, and that the UK government is already um, uh, giving a number of indications of where it wants to use generative AI in public services. I also expect we're going to see other applications. I expect generative um, AI is going to be used in the, the likely um, general election we have here in the UK and the, the, num the number of elections around the world next year as well. So just to as well introduce some of the, the business cases that particularly I'm seeing and working with, with companies at the moment. I think you know some of the early business cases around automated customer support, around marketing, so generating um, marketing content and also um, tailoring that to targeted um, marketing as well in terms of how that content will be tailored, business process automation, data analytics, in the recruitment field as well, and also in learning development in, um, in companies as well. So just five examples, I'm sure many of you would give me um, lots more as well, but it's rapidly um, being integrated um, into businesses as we speak. I think there are a number of um, sort of complex and novel features about generative AI, well, some challenges are familiar from uh, historic uses of algorithms and machine learning, which has obviously been around for, for, for many years before the, um, before, before the advent of generative AI. So at the heart of the, um, the questions um, today I'm going to talk about, 
data protection by design is obviously a crucial concept in the GDPR. It's about responsible innovation. It's about safeguarding against risks and upholding data protection rights. So how do we approach these rights? Do these rights need new interpretation? Do these rights actually need to evolve and data protection law needs to change? Or must the central design of generative AI systems and um, large language models actually change? So I've just got one slide I'm going to use today, um, which just tries to um, set the scene really uh, and explain really all of the different points that your personal data can flow through the generative AI um, ecosystem. So I think it's important to recognize we've got um, organizations with data sources. So that's the, you know, where the training data will flow into um, the generative um, AI models. We have generative AI developers, such as OpenAI. We have generative AI deployers. So that could be a bank seeking to um, <coughs> integrate the open AI technology into a chatbot to, put to, to, put to interact with their customers. We have developers and deployers. We obviously have us as individual users interacting with both the developer systems directly. So we could use ChatGTP directly. And we're, we're, into, uh, we're interacting with those deployers as well. And also, as well, those deployers in using those generative um, AI systems that have been um, developed will also perhaps be using their own training data as they adapt their model in terms of how they actually provide their offering as well. And of course, we've got personal data flowing um, in and out when someone is querying and, and using the, um, the generative AI system from both the developer and deployers. So the personal data is flowing in and out there. And of course, we've got the learning as well. So the learning is going back in, in terms of actually learning from our queries and that actually feeding back into the, um, the large language model as well. So that learning as well could flow from the, deploy from the deployer back into the developer system as well. So I think just the, the point of this slide, I think, is just to illustrate all the different points at which um, data protection questions about compliance can emerge. So, you know, just taking the first one as an example, you know, the questions start here in terms of um, what the controllers who, um, who, who are responsible for these data sets, for example, a, a social media company whose data might be scraped and go into the generative AI developer's model, what approach do they need to take to safeguard that data as a controller? So many different questions that we're going to need to consider. So I'm just going to talk through now um, some of the key questions which I think are going to emerge under GDPR. They're also likely to emerge under other data protection laws around the world. So the first one is transparency. So obviously GDPR um, contains um, important provisions around transparency um, under Articles 13 and 14. And that's got to be transparency to um, individuals whose data is taken and is scraped and goes into the, and is used as part of the training data, and also transparency to these users of the system as well. So again, how does that transparency actually happen in practice? How can we actually provide that in an explainable way? And how can we actually um, realize that in a practical way so it actually makes a difference to the individual understanding? And obviously that is heightened if those individual um, users are actually being subject to um, an automated decision. Of course, as well, we should remember in terms of the training data that these issues are completely novel. So our personal data has already been indexed on a, on a, on a large scale by search engines like Google, and that's been happening um, for many years. What level of transparency is appropriate in that search engine context? What's different about the generative AI context is the risk to us greater, so there should be a heightened level of transparency beyond what Google provides when our, our data is indexed into the search engine. We've also got questions about the, 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 um, the important roles under the GDPR, so the role of the controller being the responsible entity and then the processor who acts under the instructions of the controller. And I think you've got to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis, so where is the controller, where is the processor, and how do they actually discharge their um, accountabilities under the GDPR, and who, of course, is liable. That relationship as well, if you say you have, you have um, a controller and a processor relationship, you're also, of course, going to have the enterprise contract, which will be between the developer and the um, deployer. Of course, as well, you're going to have questions about how um, accountability is actually demonstrated in practice through um, the controllers demonstrating data protection by design, showing how they actually mitigate the risks to individuals um, in practice and how they undertake data protection impact assessments in terms of their responsibilities. 
The next um, sort of set of key questions um, to consider are around the actual data protection rights. So we've got many data protection rights that we're familiar with, so particularly the right of correction uh, under, under GDPR. And of course, the, the, right, um, the right to erasure, often known as the, the, the right to be forgotten. How is that going to work in a generative AI context? So what happens when we have information related to us, the, um, the uh, large language model is essentially <coughs> hallucinating. So that's certainly something I experienced when I first put my name into ChatGPT and it said I'd worked the, the Ministry of Justice in a previous career. I'd never worked the Ministry of Justice. So um, these tools were essentially are, you know, fictionalizing, they're, they're making up this information. How does that interact with your um, right to um, correction or to actually um, request to have that information deleted? And again, of course, we have got some precedent here. You go back to the CJU case, the Costea case, the Google Spain case in 2014. That dealt with the right to be forgotten, to essentially be de-indexed and delisted from search engine results. So what can we learn from that in terms of how we approach those questions? But there are really some quite difficult technical questions the way large language models are actually developed in terms of the, the tokenization and really the series of numbers that make up a, a model. It's not, not, not just like deleting someone's name from a database to remove um, the details which would actually give effect to um, a right to, to, to request a um, deletion, for example. So how does that actually operate in practice? I think we're still waiting to see how some of that's going to, going to play out. We, just, of course, have the right under Article 22 that was mentioned earlier in terms of the um, right to automated decisions. We also have questions about a lawful basis. So on what lawful basis um, are all of these different activities taking place? Is it consent? Is it legitimate interest? So if, if it's legitimate interest under Article 6 of the GDPR, particularly as well then considering that the fact, the fact that there's a necessity test there as well and how that's playing out. For example, are the generative AI developers relying on legitimate interest for the, for the use of the personal data for the training, um, for the training part of the, the model development? We also have, of course, all of the principles in GDPR in Article 5, so most important, fairness. So the ICO, the, the regulator for data protection in the UK, has updated their AI guidance this year to break down and provide more information about fairness. And I think what's very interesting about fairness is we don't actually have a lot of precedent, particularly in the UK, about what fairness really means um, under data protection law, and certainly not in the context of interaction with algorithmic systems as well. So I think it's going to be quite an important area that will be tested by the courts. So we're going to need to break it down, I think, to understand what bias and discrimination really means in the context of fairness, what it means in terms of the fairness, in terms of actually designing and selecting the data that goes into the data set, the fairness in terms of design of the system, in terms of the choices that the individual makes, and also the fairness of the outcomes delivered by the system, the fairness in the way it's implemented. So those concepts are taken from the, um, the ICO guidance. We of course also have the uh, other Article 5 principles in GDPR, the accuracy principles, so that relates to the, the, the challenge I mentioned earlier about hallucinated output. We have the challenge of data minimization in terms of how that applies to um, the scale of the training data that is being, being gathered as well. So just uh, some of the key questions um, that we need to identify. And just very briefly, and I want to sort of to finish off to talk about some of the key um, actions that have been taken by data protection regulators. So on the first part of the equation, the, the data scraping question, about 10 data protection authorities around the world, including the, the ICO, have issued a statement to say they are now focusing on data scraping to make sure that those who make data publicly available have safeguards in place to stop it. So it, that's one area the data protection authorities are starting to take action. And I think you can, you can start to see a build-up, I think, of actions across all of these different areas as um, data protection authorities sort of assess the risks and also respond to complaints they receive. Because the most important one I'm going to mention is the um, action taken by the Italian data protection authority, the Garante, in March of this year. I think it's one of the really a, a big sort of headline moment around the world, because obviously they issued um, a temporary ban on um, ChatGPT operating in Italy. They used their Article 58 powers under GDPR to issue that ban. That ban lasted a month. And the key questions that the Italian Garante identified were transparency, 
a lack of lawful basis for the, for the training data, for the personal data and the training data under Article 6, inaccurate personal data, so raising you know, the, the point about hallucination, processing of personal data and of children under 13. So all of those initial questions came up. It was then lifted after a month. I don't think all of those questions were really answered, but I think the Italian data protection regulator was then under great pressure in Italy to <laughs> release its ban and I think then continue its investigation. So I don't think it's the end of the story. Did they perhaps move a bit too quickly? Um, it's something interesting to be discussed. So I think that just sort of highlights you know, the fact that data protection regulators are going to be very central to regulation of generative AI particularly before the EU AI Act comes into force. And in the UK, we're not going to have that piece of legislation as well. So I think it's important to um, understand that. I think also we're going to see a number of different actions around the world. The Federal Trade Commission has a very big complaint in from the civil society body about um, chat GPT as well. So I think it's very much what watch this space in answering some of those questions. So I've posed a lot of questions in my presentation. I'm also happy to pick up some of the points in, in more detail from the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve. There were lots of very pertinent and relevant questions. And I'm sure there are lots more questions as well from the audience in terms of what may be reviewed in future regarding generative AI and its compliance with the GDPR. And as Natalie already mentioned, so there could be some very interesting developments within UK policy making and the future of the data protection bill here and how that will respond to challenges in terms of generative AI and what shape then the white paper on AI will take in the future. But before we delve more into those questions in the Q&A, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Graham Smith. Graham is a counsel at Bird & Bird LLP based in London. His practice encompasses advisory and contentious work in the internet, IT and intellectual property fields. He has advised various kinds of internet actors on topics including copyright, intermediary liability and cross-border issues. He has commented extensively on what was the online safety bill and its preceding white paper. He edits and co-authors the leading textbook, Internet Law and Regulation, published by Sweet and Maxwell. And he also writes the highly recommended cyber legal blog. Graham will be speaking with us today on the role and regulation of AI systems under the now Online Safety Act. Great, thank you very much, Nora. Um, can I abuse my privilege of being on this panel to ask, pose a question to Robert for him to think about before he's uh, at, the end, at the end? Yes? No? <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to use and say no. <laughs> so it's about red lines, which is a theme. Um, in some of the early surveillance cases, I think it may have been the data retention cases, the, the Strasbourg Court um, mentioned the concept of, of interference with the essence of the rights, um, which, as I understand, is a threshold question. If there's an interference with the essence of the right, and you don't go on to look at proportionality or anything else, that's the end of it. Um, it, it then seemed to disappear from view. <laughs> um, and so my question is, whatever happened to the essence of the right and may it resurface? That was a short question. Don't answer now. <laughs> All right, so AI and the Online Safety Act. Um, the Online Safety Bill, as was, um, received rather sent in the end of October, and Ofcom launched its first consultation on illegal harms under the, under the Act on the 9th of November. So the Act is um, well and truly underway. And one of the questions that came up quite often uh, in Parliament was, does the Online Safety Act regulate AI? To which the answer is not as such. You won't find any mention of AI uh, in the Act. But what you do find is, uh, firstly, various references to 
um, automated tools and indeed to bots. I think this may be the first act that actually uses the word bot. Um, you'll find a definition at the end of the act that says automated tool includes a bot. It doesn't define what a bot is. But there we are. Um, it has, uh, has that within it. But also the bill, sorry, the act is tech agnostic. So if a function regulated by the act is performed or driven by AI, then to that extent, um, the AI um, element of it is going to be within the, um, within the scope of the, of the act. So firstly, um, there we are. What is the, uh, just to give you an idea of the structure of the act, it's um, the regulated entity, the directly regulated entities are user to user services, discussion forums, social media platforms, and so on, and search services, and they are subject to duties of care, and those duties of care can require them to interfere with the content uh, posted by users. And sitting behind it all is Ofcom, which will issue a case of practice and which uh, can enforce the duties. So looking at so has that gone is that gone dead? Sorry. I'll try this one. Yep. Hello? That's better. So in that sense you can regard the platforms as being directly regulated by the Act and we users as being indirectly regulated by it as our what we post to these platforms is liable to be affected, interfered with by platforms uh, fulfilling their duties of care. So I've identified four uh, touch points where AI may be relevant to this structure. First is users. Um, users, as defined, include not only we human users, but um, bots automated tools, and um, it actually uh, specifically deals with it, says that reference to content generated, etc., by user includes content generated, etc., by means of software or an automated tool, the bot or other automated tool is to be regarded as a user of the service, and then it tells you under what conditions that's true. So if, you're, um, you, if you are, uh, your user is in fact an AI-driven bot, then what it posts to the forum um, is liable to be affected, indirectly regulated by the, by the, uh, the Act. Secondly, there are transparency duties. Um, just have to always look this up and read it out. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there we go. There are duties under the Act about um, the terms and conditions of, um, uh, 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 of the providers and there are transparency duties about what is in those terms and conditions. And in particular, one of the duties is a duty to include provisions in the terms of service giving information about any proactive technology used by the service for the purpose of compliance with one of the duties. And Proactive technology, um, things like upload filtering, clearly can embrace um, uh, automated and AI type systems. And the duty is also to ensure that the terms that the terms of service, those provisions are clear and accessible. Which does raise the question: so, if you are using a um, AI system to detect and to prevent. Um, people encountering particular types of content, and you're doing that for the purpose of compliance with the duties under the Act, then you have a duty to explain in your terms and conditions clearly and excessively how it works, which in the context of AI and the inexplicable black box that tends to sit at the, um, at the, uh, the heart of some of these systems um, is possibly a challenging requirement. But there it is. That's that's what it says. And it, it says using these systems for the purpose of uh, fulfilling the uh, compliance with the duties of care. In theory, um, if a platform is using this system 
you know, voluntarily but not to fulfill the duty of care, then that would be outside of that. But in practice, um, if it's a system which a platform is likely to rely upon, uh, if challenged by the regulator to say, well, this is what I'm doing to fulfill these duties of care, then um, in practice, that's going to be within that. So that's going to be a significant challenge, I think, for some of the platforms to explain what these systems are, are doing in their terms in terms of service. Thirdly, uh, AI-powered search. If you've got um, AI in your search uh, service, then that element is going to be within scope. It's an example of a functionality which is in scope, is regulated, and if it's driven or powered by AI, then it's going to be in scope, not because it's AI, but because it's search. And fourthly, and this is possibly the, the most um, controversial one, is the, the Act, um, sorry, the duties under the Act include things like a duty to use proportionate measures to prevent someone, in, uh, prevent users encountering illegal uh, content. And because these are proactive duties, uh, it contemplates the use of automated tools and systems to do that, whether it's upload filtering, whether it, or whatever. Now, when you look at the, um, the Ofcom consultation, they have pretty much drawn back from that and not and, and recommended very, very few kinds of automated system. But um, it could be that in the future that um, there will be recommendations to, to use um, AI type systems for the detection and policing of user content. Um, and that engages with um, privacy, all the kinds of data protection considerations that we've been um, hearing about. And it's actually quite um, it's quite noticeable when you look at the, um, at the Ofcom consultation that dotted around in the consultation when it comes to these kind of um, systems are various caveats saying, of course, you have to think about the data protection and privacy implications of this. And whilst at some places it, it is quite specific about how you would do that, in other places um, it's really quite vague. It just says you have to think about it, but doesn't tell you uh, very much about what that would um, what that would involve, and in the context of the Ofcom consultation, which is about illegal detecting illegality, illegal harms, there are um, there's a provision in the Act which sets out how platforms uh, have, and search engines have to go about making judgments as to what is and isn't illegal. And there's a provision in there which makes quite clear that it contemplates those judgments being made um, not only you know, by human moderators, certainly by combinations of automated systems and human moderators, but also potentially by completely automated systems. So there is, there is really no doubt that these kinds of systems um, are contemplated in the Act by, by the Act, and if off comma at some point go down the road of making recommendations for the use of these systems, uh, all these uh, issues that we have been hearing about um, will, uh, will then uh, have, to be, um, have to be taken into account. And uh, there is a whole separate section of the Act which I'm not going to talk about, about age assurance and if a, uh, age estimation, if AI systems are going to be used for that, then the whole area of the Act that regulates that will then come into play. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much for, Grim, for giving a really impressive overview of what is a very complex Rolling piece of legislation under the Online Safety Act and 
perhaps I shouldn't say say this, but I did appreciate the question that you put Robert Spanner earlier on, and maybe we can reflect on that when we get to the Q and A stage of the panel. But right now, last but not at all least, I am delighted to introduce Professor Kingsley Abbott. Kingsley is director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies here at the University of London, and he joined us recently in April. He has more than 20 years of experience in international non-governmental organizations, the United Nations, and domestic legal practice. For nine years, he was based in Thailand, where he served the International Commission of Jurists as the Director of Global Accountability and International Justice. During this time, he developed and led numerous human rights and rule of law initiatives in Asia and around the world. Prior to that, he worked as Senior Legal Advisor at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal in Cambodia, and as trial counsel in the Office of the Prosecutor at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon in The Hague. He started his career in his home country of New Zealand, where he mainly practiced as a criminal barrister under a leading King's counsel. Kingsley will be providing some reflections from a practitioner's perspective on everything that we've discussed this morning, but particularly within the context of the global south and countries that have weak standards with regard to the rule of law. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks very much for, for having me. Um, I've been given the, the easy task of summarising some of what's already been discussed and drawing a ring around it and looking for some common points of observation. And as you heard, my own background is someone who's new to the UK, new to Europe, just a few months, and I've spent most of my career living and working in Asia and the Global South and working on rule of law and human rights issues in difficult environments, often in the context of repressive states and other global programs around the world. So, you know, listening to, to Robert and his description of how EU law and the European Court of Human Rights is wrestling with these issues, and whether they end up with consistent positions or not, ban versus the human rights test and so on, really reminded me um, of the strength of having um, an international human rights legal framework, having a European human rights legal framework and a strong rule of law, something which I think many of us living here very much take for granted. It's very unusual for me to sit in a room where such a detailed and robust discussion takes place about the protections that exist around us and above us in this context. Usually the experience is very different. In Stephen Graham's presentations, I think, you know, doing a deep dive into some of the different efforts at protection, um, very much reminded me, if I can say so, that to, to be reminded of the sort of the big picture fact that these new technologies and artificial intelligence and so on is being mostly created for profit by non-state actors. It's a business model, and it's a business and human rights issue. Businesses, as we know, and I know everyone in this room knows this, knows this already, businesses have the responsibility to respect human rights, including by conducting human rights due diligence. And states have a responsibility to regulate business activity to ensure the protection of human rights. I really enjoyed Natalie's presentation because she reminded us um, through a very important observation, which is that understanding the ecosystem or the landscape into which these technologies is being deployed is really critical. So strong legal human rights framework, understanding the context into which these technologies are being deployed. And that brings me then to some of the remarks that I wanted to make. And as, as we heard already, um, I come from more of a practitioner's background. And I thought that it would be nice to sort of offer a perspective to, um, to add to the, the fantastic presentations we've heard about the situation in the UK and Europe with the way in which these conversations are taking part in some other parts of the world, particularly where there's a weak rule of law, and to share some concerns about the development of new technologies um, from the perspective of human, of human rights defenders in the field, and to perhaps end with some recommendations if we've still got time. But I want to emphasize this is very much a snapshot it's difficult to cover everything that needs to be said about what's happening in the global south in just a few minutes. But the backdrop is that in many parts of the world, the very idea 
of the rule of law and human rights and democracy is very much under attack. And these new technologies provide new ways to achieve the aims of that campaign. And to give you just one emblematic example of this, because it's very real, and I had something of a front row seat to it, to give you an emblematic example of this anti-human rights and anti-rule of law campaign from the Asia region, is that I was once invited to speak to some very high level uh, government officials in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh. And they told me that they and all of their staff had been invited to conduct postgraduate studies in China. And I said to this gentleman, oh, that's very interesting. So, you know, all of the office is doing postgraduate studies in China, and he said yes. And I said to him, well, what did you study? Um, expecting him to say anything. And he said, well, actually, we studied the role of civil society in countries. And he said to me, it's very interesting, actually. We used to think that civil society had uh, a very important role to play in the stability of the country. But we are learning that they can also be a very powerful destabilizing force. And I thought, goodness, he obviously hadn't Googled what I do and who I was. I was there as an international human rights lawyer. And what he meant by saying that it's a destabilizing force is he meant, you know, destabilizing what they often call in Cambodia the importance of the rule of law. And they don't mean the rule of law as we understand it. They mean rule by law, law and order, the enactment of laws that need to be applied and obeyed, including by political dissidents and the journalists and others. And so I just wanted to take this opportunity to say that this is the landscape, to go back to Natalie's point, this is the landscape and the context into which these new technologies, including, including artificial intelligence, is being introduced in many parts of the world. In places like Cambodia, which is now a de facto one-party state, where the kind of narrative I just described is dominant, there is a lot of talk about artificial intelligence at the state level. But the predominant conversations are around how fantastic this technology is going to be and how it should be embraced in business and healthcare and education and finance to enhance productivity and efficiency and socioeconomic development. You know, there's a lot of truth in, in that, as we know. These are similar conversations happening elsewhere. But there's not so much of a conversation about the risks of these technologies to democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. When, when I, uh, Nora kindly asked me to, to share some observations today, I thought, I'll just reach out to my network of human rights defenders you know, around the world, um, many of those friendships I've maintained, just to sort of get an up-to-date briefing on what some of the the current issues there are that they are wrestling with. And, you know, I'll just share a couple of them here. I mean, there's, there's many, but we have just a few minutes. The biggest concern is surveillance at the moment. Number one, across the board. The concern is the way in which these new technologies um, is being adopted and used without consultation and without transparency. And we've heard talk of transparency several times already today. The concern is that these new technologies will be used to deepen repression in places where repression already exists. Uh, a Thai friend of mine said to me that in the human rights defender community, AI is hardly spoken about outside of the consequences it will have on the state ability to monitor and crack down on their activities as dissenting voices. And to give one example very briefly of the way new technologies are being used against dissenting voices in Thailand, just last year, 30 people, some of whom are friends of mine, were found to have had their phones targeted with Pegasus spyware, most of whom were prominent pro-democracy activists, lawyers, academics, civil society. And the fact that the state appears to have been willing to use this Pegasus spyware against perceived opponents reveals what it might do when new AI surveillance technologies are placed on the market. And according to Amnesty International, Pegasus only supplies its technology to states. Speaking of the market, the marketplace for these new technologies, as we know, 
China has engaged in adopting and deploying artificial intelligence as part of a goal set in 2017 to make China the world's leading AI hub by 2030. And the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace has estimated that Chinese artificial intelligence surveillance technologies are being rolled out in more than 50 Belt and Road, uh, Belt and Road Initiative countries as part of its Digital Silk Road Initiative. Cambodian members of civil society describe that they are already under constant surveillance from mostly Chinese supplied cameras, software and drones. Just another example, in parts of Africa, in Uganda, China has played a role in developing the digital information stack and has developed surveillance hardware across the country which has been uh, aiding security forces um, to track political opponents. In Myanmar, where I did a lot of work over the last several years in the country, whilst we were still able to get into the country, uh, there was recently a very bloody coup, as many of you know, um, and there were reports that Chinese firms are deploying 4G and 5G networks as well as facial recognition systems in several cities. And when I talk about the rule of law, if you focus really on Cambodia and, and Myanmar in particular, less so in Thailand, it, it is unheard of to go to the courts to challenge frameworks, to challenge um, alleged violations of rights. People stay away from the courts. And the judges and the prosecutors lack independence, <coughs> lack impartiality, <coughs> lack confidence. In Myanmar, they're very much a wing of the military. And so this is the environment into which these new technologies are pouring in. At the same time, interestingly, in many parts of Asia, the very idea of privacy, the right to privacy, is not very well understood and is not being discussed in the context of these new technologies. And friends of mine working in these environments have questions like, who is collecting this data? Where is it being stored? How will it be used, including by AI technologies in the future? And overlaid on this, they say, is the power, obviously, we know of, of big tech and the lack of focus on ethics and self-regulation in some cases. Many of these same concerns are what is being expressed in, in Latin America. A feature of Latin America, as some of you know, is the rapid uptake of facial recognition technology, which we've heard about already today, including live facial recognition technology, given that fighting crime is a, is a major um, priority for many. Um, but friends have reported that this technology is being deployed without transparency as to where it comes from, how it was developed, the extent to which civil society or even law enforcement were involved in its development, if at all, a lack of human rights impact assessments, a lack of oversight mechanisms, weak legal grounds on which it's being used, and a lack of transparency overall. And a lack of transparency provides an obstacle to accountability as well which is why I was very interested to hear about the Russia case. They talked about a lack of transparency in terms of establishing the evidential foundation for how and why and where this technology is being used. And there are other concerns too. This is to echo what, what Natalie uh, was talking about. The impact on embedding societal discrimination and inequalities in these technologies. The databases used by AI to identify potential suspects are allegedly the police databases, which sometimes reflect discriminatory policing, where police records reflect the disproportionate criminalization of people based on certain race, certain income levels, and there are numerous examples. And these long-standing structural inequalities and discriminatory biases already present in policing then gets carried over into the AI technology, which is using these same uh, police databases. And I think we've also seen similar examples of this in the UK and the US. There was also a lot of talk about the way it's been used by the justice sector in the development of decisions and judgments in different parts of Latin America, which maybe Natalie I'll talk to you about later and I'll skip over. So I'll just conclude with a, a, a few recommendations, perhaps, um, some of which echo what Robert already said. I think first and foremost is human rights, to ensure that the development and use of technologies is very much grounded in, in, in international human rights law and regional human rights law and standards with mechanisms for accountability. Two is, I think, the importance of best practice exchanges between the Global North and the Global South. Not a sort of Global North lecture to the Global South, obviously, 
but a meaningful two-way exchange on the development of these, these sorts of conversations we're having and the development of best practices. I think meaningful consultation um, when new technologies are seeking to be introduced, which is transparent around agenda setting and decision making. The need for independent research, the need for transparency across the board. I think regular monitoring as well in states where there is a weak rule of law and a lack of regulation or an unwillingness to regulate um, or a misuse of regulation, which is another conversation. Needs, there needs to be close monitoring by the international community and engagement where possible. And lastly, I think most importantly of all where I will end is to say strong and meaningful support for civil society around the world, particularly in countries where there's a weak rule of law, where they're already facing repression, to look at ways in which they can be supported to really understand meaningfully their priorities and to work support the work they're doing often facing very serious consequences of retaliation.